Morning all, let's have a look at the key um, game yesterday, which I believe was in the key match, Armenia versus Ukraine, Ukraine being the defending champions from last year, headed up by Vasily Ivanchuk, 2769 GM, Super GM. But Armenia, having got a bad player on board one, Aronian, Levon Aronian, 2816, the top seeded player of the tournament, the top rated player rather, of the tournament. So both teams are averaging around uh, 2700 or more average rating over 2700 on both teams and um, so let's see Aronian playing white played knight f3 unassuming for a moment and black responded symmetrically with knight f6 and now we see c4 so for the moment it's English opening territory but it's going to quickly transpose into the Queen's Indian defense variations d4 b6 and now g3 and bishop a6 it looks like queen's indian territory now and okay this this move encourages white to defend this there's various shops options here white chooses b3 and now black throws in this check which causes some um discoordination of white's pieces and um is is a common idea seemingly losing a tempo but uh, very very good for causing some congestion here and the bishop really wants to be on b2 not on c3 where it could be a target but okay it's well known idea so knight c3 bishop b7 now okay and white continues bishop g2 so both of these bishops are now staring at each other both sides now castle. Black with bishop b7 of course is keeping a lockdown on e4. Now we see knight a6 and there's a common idea um, in, in some variations which used to be very popular even in Kasparov's era of, of Olympiads uh, to sack a pawn uh, with the idea here uh, to play d5 and usually in the past the continuation after e takes d which was the game continuation here was to play knight h4 and um, I think there's been a lot of analysis of this particular way of sacking the pawn and um, black is often playing moves like this uh, securing d5 and getting some sort of compensation if you remember on this channel there was there was a classic Kasparov Olympiad game where he had loads of pieces around White's King around Black's King as a result of this pawn sack. Um now was was this actual line with D five uh, a bit risky for Black even to allow in principle? Well actually um when we saw Bishop B seven here, I believe there might be an option just uh to put pressure more pressure on C four. So, for example, I think if castles, okay, say say white plays bishop g2, then I think d5, and I think this is a known queen's Indian position as well, which might be a little bit more solid in that respect of not even allowing white uh, the pawn sack idea for d5. So, is this idea dangerous here? Um, well, and how and how exactly will it be used? The surprising thing for me is actually it's not used with the idea of knight h4 here so that's the more common treatment I, I would have I would have thought but actually the move knight d4 is played so it's still setting up this pin on the diagonal uh, but there's an intriguing aspect to this knight d4 about to be revealed uh, which maybe gives gives it certain advantages over knight h4 to f5. The knight can actually reroute, as we're about to see, to c2 and e3 to put more pressure on that d5 pinned pawn. Let's just check. Uh, I'm fascinated uh, from an engine point of view here about knight h4, knight d4. Yeah, it seems engines like knight d4 as a move in this position. Um, knight h4 in this position. Actually, there might even be knight e4. Let's have a look at the specific nuances here. This kind of position, 
might be in some way different to um, to the usual positions where d5 and knight h4 is played. Okay, let's have a look at this variation. Black might be doing fine here uh, with the knight on f5 as a sort of tactical liability. So we have we have some major differences for the way this pawn has been sacrificed. Um, so if we go back to knight d4, okay, let's turn that off or stop it out. So bishop c5, which okay, bishop c5 does actually neglect against a potential pin here, which could be damaging to Black's pawn structure. And the knight is is wanting uh, to do this maneuver anyway. But there's a specific tactical idea that um, Vasily Imichuk had in mind, which is brilliant, seemingly absolutely brilliant idea, um, to temporarily sack a piece. We're about to see knight c2. Okay. So now white is potentially freer for this seemingly really nasty pin, and it would seem a bit weird for, for the bishop to have to go back and lose time. But for the moment, okay, c6 reinforcing the d5 pawn. So we have here a temporary pawn sacrifice scenario. Cd, cd, black structure um, might not be ideal if that pawn is lost, but um, how quickly does white want to get back the pawn? That's the thing. Um, sometimes the the timing, you know, taking time to get back material gets more more yield for the for the sacrifice. So bishop g5, that nasty pin, and um, okay, let's see what if you know black um, goes bishop e7. We need to be testing bishop e7, but for the moment this pin. Um, is putting immediate pressure now on d5. Uh, bishop e7 here, you might think, well, it might actually be defensive if it comes back on this diagonal. The move in the game was knight c7, but let's check bishop e7 in this position. Is there any other better moves than knight c7? Bishop e7 might be a viable alternative, apparently. Um, White well, doesn't want to be too forceful here, but if he goes knight e3 and then just collects his pawn back, in fact, even here, even the engine doesn't have a rush to take the pawn. It's, it's going to be, um, it's, it's not actually going to be possible here because of knight takes d5 anyway. If you take the pawn here, knight, this 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 rebounds tactically on this diagonal because of this knight takes d5 tactic. So here, though, a pawn down. But um, a lot of pressure, and now here's here's the time when this diagonal has been sorted out. This pawn can be recaptured with advantage to white in control of d5, and this iron you know knight on d5 with iron grip is is beautiful uh, yield for the temporary pawn sacrifice for white to have a very nice positional advantage. So that's the thing. It has to be wary of. In playing a move like Bishop e7, but he's got a tactical solution in mind uh, here after Knight e3. A very surprising tactical solution. So I wonder if you can guess it. So we said this pawn is pinned to that bishop on b7, but um, guess what Black plays here? In any case, if I give you ten seconds. Okay, it might not be a brilliant move, um, as, as especially um, okay. But let's have a look. D four. So he's offering his bishop on B seven. So Black is uh, sacrificing the piece there. And of course, he's got the knights forked. After Bishop takes B seven, Rook B eight is now played, leaving three pieces attacked. But uh, White can do something horrible uh, now. To black, and maintain uh, the spirit of you know maintain another pawn sacrifice. White now just uh, plays knight g4. He's going to inflict structural damage for the pawn sacrifice. Black takes on c3, and bishop takes f6. 
it's it's a horrible structure and it's around Black's King and we have a major soft spot issue H7 now on this diagonal. Black hasn't got the light squared bishop. So this bishop returning back to this diagonal is going to be dangerous with, with immediate threats like Queen D3 when this happens. So this is really now very dangerous for Black's King's safety as well as the structure being a bit wrecked. So pawns, pawn counts 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, yep. White is definitely a pawn down here. But with brilliant compensation, Bishop E4, he controls the light squares. And okay, the knight supports d5, and this this pawn could be supported. But white still has this very dangerous now diagonal after bishop c2, immediately threatening queen d3, just winning on the spot. So black has to do something about this. Um, you might think, well, what about king h8? It doesn't help. This this battery is so powerful here. It just it's just mating. Nothing can defend here h7. King g7, another try. Hang on a sec for rook h8. And actually, we need to check this one. Okay, so bishop c2 was played here. And Ibnchuk tried f5 actually, but was there any other defense? Okay, let's, let's check here. King g7 as a try. f5 is given as, as, as one of the um, stronger moves. King g7, it gets blasted with queen c1. Dark square attack on h6. So it doesn't matter about rook h8. You just play check and then you play knight takes f6, winning black's queen. Crushing. So queen c1, a killer move here. Although the pawn's guarding d2, the queen can slip to c1 to get that immediate attack on h6. So it's very, very unpleasant black's king safety aspect here. After bishop c2. How can black deal with this? This structure. This pawn sacrifice seems totally and utterly uh, justified now. So black plays f5, and he hopes to make white's pieces like loose here, as many of them as possible with this, as well as defending h7. So what way to take on f5, or is it going to be ignored? Well, actually, the game continuation is knight h6 check. I believe that is a lot stronger than bishop takes f5. Uh, I think bishop takes f5, might run into queen g5. Let's have a quick check. So engines like knight h6, bishop f5, queen g5, and these pieces queen d3, h5, knight e5. This is, I think, still good for white. Even in this position, it's still good for white. But um, the game continuation with knight h6 is apparently is technically stronger to just get this knight to f5. So why is that technically stronger? Well, it's Kasparov's favourite position for a knight. In many Kasparov games, the knight on f5 has been a key decisive factor. It's stopping now you know, black from playing a move like f5. It's controlling d4. If this bishop wasn't controlling d4, then queen d4 would be a beautiful move to coordinate with that knight. So can white try and uproot the bishop? That's one key thing to make use of that knight. It needs other pieces to help it, to make it even better. Queen f6 covers that diagonal though. And now we see the bishop being um, attempted to be uprooted with a3. Okay. So equal on pawns here. But white's control of the light squares is impressive. Black controls the dark squares more, of course, and has this advanced pawn on c3. But it can be a tactical vulnerability in its own right. a5 to stop b4. Queen d3, which really ties down the queen now to c3. And you might ask, OK, in this position, well, black's got some play surely. He's got rook g8 now. In some circumstances, this might actually be good to double up rooks and pressure on the king side. But this bishop's being uprooted now with another pawn sacrifice, b4. So what's the point of this? a takes, a takes. The compensation now is this very dangerous rook on the seventh. The knight goes to a central square. It seems attractive enough, knight e6. Introducing things like knight g5, maybe knight f4, knight c5. It looks quite dangerous 
in some respects. Okay. But there is, of course, this lurking battery on H7, and that's made use of here, rather cruelly, to play knight e7, which is actually winning the exchange. And you might ask, hold on a sec, wasn't that move available just earlier as well? Let's 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 ask this question. Couldn't couldn't this have been used now? After rook g8 instead of b4. Why throw in b4? Well, getting the rook on the seventh is adding more pieces to support the knight on f5. This rook on the seventh is also going to be quite dangerous. So I think knight e7 must must be a move in this position as well to to win the exchange. Or is it not? <laughs> knight e7 in this position. No, it's rook g7. Doesn't win the exchange at all. So what what changed there? Queen d3. Here, after knight e7 here. Is is there rook g7 as a move? No. Because of knight takes d5 here. And that's one other point. This bishop's now loose, and we have this almighty knight fork winning material. So that's the key difference. That knight e7 has been made a lot more effective for two reasons. The bishop's loose on b4 as a tactical target for knight e7 takes d5, forking queen and bishop. And the rook, of course, is joining the party. So this is just winning the exchange now, knight e7, because of this threat of knight d5. Rook g7 is not available. Okay, queen h7, immediate threat of mate. So that's parried with queen g7. So black's the exchange down now. Okay, for a pawn. Not for a pawn after queen takes d5, though, just the exchange down. Knight f4, we must assume to be harmless here. It wasn't played. Bishop c5 was played. But um, I think knight f4. I guess queen e4, and that's that's adequate. In fact, these pieces are showing how loose they are. But there might even be uh, something stronger there. Otherwise, this might be a useful move. It's hitting e2. Let's just quickly check this position. Is queen e4 the move? Queen e4 appears to be a strong move. So say bishop d6, rook d1. It's very, very loose for black. Okay, here's the exchange down and struggling here, like in the game continuation. So bishop c5, e3, blunting the bishop. b5 as though these pawns might give black some counterplay, but now white is going for black's king, and is also, of course, attacking that rook with that move, unveiling that attack. So rook a8, and it's starting to get unpleasant with black's king safety. He takes... Check... Now the queen comes back to threaten queen h7. Queen comes to defend like this. And now rook a1 coming to that first row to pin or do other damage. So check. Nope, not check. Rook a5 first. So what's the idea of rook a5 as opposed to rook a8 check? That's very interesting as well. What is going on here for rook a5 to be a strong move? Let's just check the, the effectiveness of rook a8 compared to rook a4 here. Rook a8 is liked by engines anyway. <clears throat> In this position, queen takes b4, and that's, that looks pretty strong, convincing. Rook a5. Let's say bishop d6. Then throw in the check. And again, if bishop f8, there's queen takes b4. And if king g7, well, the bishop's loose, potentially. But that's not the key point. Or is it f4? And this, this looks uh, very good for white. 
in any case. So interestingly, rook a5 was thrown in, but rook a8 does seem strong as well. The bishop goes immediately to f8. Now check, and now queen h4. And we have a situation here. Actually, one of the points now would seem to be that the rook, as well as having the option of rook a8, has the option of rook h5 to force maybe h6. h6 is played now. And now we see the pin finally, rook a8. The knight tries to evict the rook. And here we see a tactical combination being played. Um, can you guess why it's next move in this position if I give you 10 seconds starting from now? Okay, the hard part is is, is the follow-up as well as as renders the initial move. If you know the follow-up, that's if you can work out the follow-up for this, it's brilliant. It's rook takes f8 check. So let's examine, of course, king takes f8. Now it would seem, um, well, initially that uh, maybe queen d8, but then what about knight e8? If we look at queen d8, knight e8, or is there bishop a4 here? Let's just make sure that bishop a4. Is, is the key idea in this position. In fact, queen takes b4 has given us stronger to pick up the knight with queen b8 check, potentially. So queen d8 might not actually even be a strong move. Okay, hang on. I think it is though. Knight e8. Not bishop a4 then. Because queen e5, <laughs> okay. So the, the strongest move in this position is actually queen takes b4 check. So forget queen d8, queen takes b4. And okay, so if king j, I think it's clear enough that queen b8 check is the idea here to pick up the knight. And what if the king uh, tries to like come and save the knight? Then we have bishop a4 check here. Queen b8, picking up the knight like this, and that looks really bad for black. It's actually a forced mate here. This, this continuation of forced mate. Um, so the king, so that's why it's not to do with queen d8, it's to do with queen takes b4. So a cunning tactical combination here that this is actually very bad for black. Uh, so in the game continuation we saw queen takes f8 and in here so white plays now queen g4 check and now it's apparent that if queen g7 queen c8 is is winning like clear cut and a clear cut moment to be a bishop up so black tries king h8, but now we see queen f5, and this introduces not just queen h7 um, as an idea, but also queen e5. But both of these, you might argue, could be covered with queen uh, g7, but what about queen c8? So black is overloaded here, I think. Black actually resigned, Vesley Ivanchuk resigned in this position. Uh, let's see, let's just absolutely make sure. Is there really no defence? If king g7, we just play queen e5 winning the knight. If queen g7, we just play queen c8 winning the knight. The knight's pretty loose on c7. Loose pieces tend to drop off. So this 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 is uh, engine verified. I think combination. This this is just winning. Uh, queen f5. In fact, one of the strongest moves apparently on this brief analysis here. So this will just be a bishop up, and that's, that's fairly clear for white. These pawns are not going anywhere. So we see um, the scene was set there for white, given the opportunity for the pawn sacrifice. So I think we need to examine theoretically. You know, is is it in practice rather too dangerous to allow this, even if 
but I can't see the complications. In this position, which I'm pretty sure is well charted opening theory, but what is, what is an engine choice here? I think castling bishop g2, I think d5 is technically possible, just to verify if d5 is technically possible. I think I've seen this before many times. Um, it rings a bell. If black's stopping that d5, then, then a lot of this dynamism would be cut out of the game. But this is what makes the game so interesting. Okay, black allowed this seemingly dynamic pawn sacrifice. Um, with d5. I don't know what you all think of this on, on YouTube, this pawn sacrifice here. Um, not with the intention of knight h4, but actually knight d4. And with a positional move maneuver in mind in mind to get back the pawn with a slight advantage. So knight d4 <laughs> with a slow positional maneuver. Not minding going pawn down for several moves, basically. And you know, this is starting to wreak some real difficulties for black. The bishop coming away from its post where now bishop g5 is going to be a little bit more effective. First white doubles black's pawns here though, bishop g5, nasty pin. And um, okay, a surprising um, idea from black is unveiled here for playing d4. Was there anything else apart from d4 from an engine point of view? h6, knight e6 or bishop e3. d4 is not really, it's not really mentioned, it seems to give white a advantage from an engine point of view. If we look at bishop e3 first, actually f takes, and this looks dangerous for that pin, so black structure will still get uh, get damaged. But black can take this pawn here. Okay, forget king h1, let's go with rook f2. Now this, this situation here might be better than the game actually. It looks as though this this isn't too bad from an engine point of view. Less pieces are on the board. Um, that looks like a nasty pin for white to be in at the moment. As a qu the queen's going to have to be exchanged off at some point. So that that was that was fine. So I wonder about this. Bishop takes e3. Just briefly on brief analysis, bishop e3 has it got a lot going for it? Would white really take on? e3 with the pawn. What about bishop takes e3, just, just maintaining a pawn down? Is this position that harmful? Uh, seems to be at this point okay for black and without the structural damage anyway. Is it, if he's avoiding the structural damage here by playing bishop takes e3 then that must be good news. Maybe Analysts are going to find that this is, in the long term, this this is a better move. Bishop takes e3 than what was played. It is possible that d4 might have been the first major mistake. Um, h6 is giving White what he wants to get back the pawn with a small advantage. I think Knight just get uh, that pawn back with a nice grip on <coughs> the light squares. In fact, here knight f6, the tactical knight f6 can be played to get the knight square bishop. And we have here, in, in this scenario, an opposite color bishop situation, which, um, okay, which I think black should be able to draw. Okay, so may, maybe Ibn Shuk started to go a bit wrong with e4. Um, it, it, it's leading to structural damage in the game continuation around his king, which is proving to be very dangerous here, as we saw from the, the game evidence. So bishop e4 and very serious threats, and white's playing quite accurately not to have loose pieces himself. And he's making basically knight e7 very effective now with this b4. Knight e7 here is answered by rook g7, so he's not winning anything there. Apart from maybe if he wants to get his pawn back potentially.
but um no he's he's making sure he's winning the exchange here with knight e7 coming up now at this moment knight e7 and okay the exchange up pure exchange up equal on pawns here neutralizes that bishop the bishop's kicking the rook now we see an exchange of rooks and a surprising little move is thrown in here as well after b4 not to throw in the immediate check but to create more options actually available like uh, rook h5 and stuff in some variations so we saw check now queen h4 and it's difficult for black to defend here he played h6 what what is the engine verdict here just to make sure well is the exchange down so we expect white to be uh, better yeah h6 bishop d6 bishop d6 Does that make any difference again we get this pins piece now rook d8 rook d5 and that introduces threats now rook g5 And this knight can be loose in this variation as well, an echo variation, where the knight's kind of getting loose. There's a double attack on the knight and h7. This is getting nasty for black if he's losing h7 here. So okay, so we see we see that become a sort of dominant theme, this loose knight here when when white sacrifices the exchange. The loose knight coupled with the h7 weakness becomes the dominating theme check threatening um go to h7 it's invited sorry the gate the game um didn't not didn't go like that sorry check after check i think black um resigned here around here okay i hope um you got something out of that game it was um a very impressive pawn sacrifice by by them on aronian and it meant that um, actually Armenia ended up defeating the great Ukraine team because the other three games were draws. Uh, Movzian 2698, he drew with Ponomarov of Ukraine 2734. Okopian of Armenia drew with Volokhtin. So Okopian 2687 drew with a slightly higher rated uh, Volokhtin 2709. And on the bottom boards, we had two. Players both exactly the same rated at 2693. Sargassian drew with Ejanov on bottom board four. So Armenia not uh, got the get, got the match point there against the great Ukrainian team. Congratulations to Armenia and to Levon for this very interesting game. And also, of course, Ivanchuk for his enterprising, uh, dynamic, exciting play. Comments or questions on YouTube? Thanks very much.